It's an Archeo Death interview with Professor Howard Williams and his guest. Welcome Archeo Deathlings to another Archeo Death interview. And we're doing things slightly differently today because this is a mashup of a bit of a conversation following a presentation. And my guest today is my uh, uh, departmental colleague, uh, Professor Tim Grady, who's an expert in all things to do with modern history. But as you will be hearing about, everything to do with modern German history. And uh, welcome, Tim. Hi, Howard. Thanks for having me. Yes, and thank you for being a bit of a guinea pig in this first uh, attempt to sort of mash up a presentation and um, um, sort of a Q&A afterwards. So um, can you, for viewers, to give an introduction to um, the presentation, can you give a context of why you were, why you were giving this talk and what it was, what, what was it all about? Well, yeah, I, this was a presentation I gave for a workshop that we ran at Chester, actually, German History in the North. Um, I decided to speak a little bit about a new project I'm working on, and that's thinking about the German war dead from the two world wars buried in this country, in the Britain, United Kingdom. And then also thinking about the British war dead who ended up being buried in Germany. And I spoke in this presentation just about one part of that, and that was particularly focused on the um, German war cemetery at Cannock Chase. Fantastic. And why this interests us, as, as, as it will be very clear if anyone who stays with us and listens through, is this, of course, links to issues of cemetery, landscape design, post-conflict memory, uh, exhumation of the dead, all these things which connect into archaeological approaches to death and memory in the distant past and in the recent centuries. So without further ado, we'll skip over and you can listen to uh, Tim's presentation and we'll come back for a and a what I want to do is talk about part of a project that I've been researching over the last few years. But in short, what I'm trying to do is to explore um, the history of the German dead of the First World War and of the Second World War, who ended up buried in Britain. And then conversely, the British dead of the two world wars, who were buried in um, Germany. Now, I think what's unique about this approach and why it's important is that this is a history of the enemy being buried at home, not on some distant battlefield. So they're buried at home amongst civilians and civilian dead. Now, dealing with these bodies offers a really important uh, and different way of thinking through British-German relations during the 20th century and for approaching post-conflict memory cultures. So that's what I'm trying to do with this more generally. Today, though, um, I'm looking at uh, one very obvious site that comes into this history and plays a big role in this history, and that's the German military cemetery at Cannock Chase, or on Cannock Chase. Here it is here in all its glory. Now, this site was dedicated in 1967, and I guess in many respects is, if you like, a kind of mirror of the large, perhaps fairly familiar, Commonwealth War Graves cemeteries. Now these had existed um, in Germany since the end of the First World War, first started to be established in the 1920s, and there were four in total. But of course, we're familiar with the Commonwealth War Graves Commission cemeteries elsewhere too, particularly on the Western Front. Now, for these Commonwealth War Graves cemeteries, historians have approached these and looked at these um, and discussed them quite widely, from the likes of Mark Connolly and Mandy Morris, Michael Heffernan and others. Um, they've uh, tended to really emphasise how these sites, every aspect of these sites indeed, were designed to demonstrate some sort of sense of Englishness. From the horticultural plantings, you know, the neatly trimmed lawns, the architectural design, all of this, if you put it together, was emphasising the Englishness of the sites. Now, Cannock Chase, which we see here, pulls on similar tropes, really, to identify itself as being part of a, a German cemetery, a German memory culture. We've got the dark granite headstones that were used in other German cemeteries. Um, the Heathland setting was chosen and was supposedly supposed to represent somewhere like the Lunebacher Heide in North Germany. Use of heather, use of uh, pine trees around there as well, was also trying to help it situate, or give the impression of being situated in a North German landscape. However, although Cannock Chase tends to be seen as merely a German version of 
these British cemeteries, it's much more than some kind of imitation. The, um, and that's what I'm going to try and show today. The site actually hides some of its complexities and its deeper complexities pretty well. So what I want to show is that the German War Graves Commission, the Volksbund, and uh, the Imperial War Graves Commission, later Commonwealth War Graves Commission, did quite a good job when constructing Cannock. Chase Cemetery in burying the complexities of the two world wars. The existing identities of the German dead, whether their lives, wartime roles, even nationalities, were lost when everybody's exhumed and moved to Cannock. Um, and instead, all these different identities are subsumed into one now German, proper German cemetery. That was convenient for everybody involved. The German Work Graves Commission there wanted its dead to be seen as normal, normal war dead, died just the same as anybody else, fighting a normal war. Um, and the War Graves, the British War Graves Commission, Commonwealth War Graves Commission was content to see these German war graves, if you like, off its books and being looked after by someone else. Now, the first sense of the complexity of this site um, comes through when we look at its origin. Now, Cannock Chase, before it's established and dedicated in 1967, is already carrying a lot of baggage. Um, and we can see this when we go back to 1938 and Breslau. So in 1938 in Breslau, the um, German War Graves Commission holds its annual uh, gathering. And we can see the at the back here, or sorry, that'd be at the front of the stage there, the um, symbols of the War Graves Commission, those five crosses standing up right there, still used today, but this time flanked by swastikas. Um, it clear from this then that the German War Graves Commission was uh, never politically neutral, but then again, neither was the Imperial War Graves Commission. The entanglements of these War Graves Commissions in wider histories or wider politics, I should say, become very visible when we look at those in attendance. And in particular, this front row of the conference hall. Um, it's a bit of a rogues gallery, to be honest. So what, who we've got here, we've got sitting there, Fritz Bracht, Deputy Gauleiter for Silesia. We've got Eric von den Bach Zelewski, SS and police leader in Silesia at the time, Ernst Busch, uh, general commander of the 8th Army District. But then also we've got members of the Imperial War Graves Commission, the leading members, leading lights of the Imperial War Graves Commission, Fabian Ware, Henry Chettle and others who were there in Breslau in 1938 as well. Now, why, what are they doing there? Well, one of the multiple reasons, I guess, but one of the reasons are in Breslau is because they're negotiating over the care of British graves in Germany. And for our purposes, they're also discussing German graves in Britain. So after the First World War, the German dead in Britain have been scattered throughout the country, tending to be buried well, wherever it's convenient, but um, the kind of closest spot to where they died tended to be used. So that often meant local cemeteries, parish churchyards, and so on and so forth. So here, for example, Wilmslow Parish Church um, holds the graves of the German uh, dead listed on this headstone. And the reason they're buried here is because they happen to, it, or Wilmslow happens to be just uh, down the road, around the corner from the handful of First World War prisoner of war camp. And these dead, these individuals had died there, so they're buried nearby. After the First World War, then, you've got thousands of German graves scattered in several hundred different sites around the country, so all over the place. The German World Graves Commission had planned, and what it discussed at Breslau, was to set up four new cemeteries where it could centralise its war dead. It wanted to centralise them in Shropshire, in Yorkshire, Porter's Bar, and at Stobbs. Um, Peel War Graves Commission thought this was a great idea too, and was supportive for the plans, but nonetheless, it never comes to pass. One of the reasons for this is that, um, well, German war graves in Britain become a bit of a magnet for the Nazi movement in the country. 
So that's politically not great. And then there's also a fear, um, Metropolitan Police point this out, that perhaps if you gave the Nazi regime access to prime sites in Britain, that they could be used for spying in any kind of future war. So in the end, the whole plan to centralise the German dead in four sites never happens. After 1945, the question of the German dead, though, comes back again. Only now we've got even more dead. Over 7,000 dead scattered now around the country in more than 700 different cemeteries. German War Graves Commission, the Volksbund, picks up um, the baton really from where it left off. Short period of rehabilitation, then it gets going again, and it continues to negotiate with the Imperial War Graves Commission to push for some kind of central site for its war dead. It's even led by the same personalities. So Christelle Eulen here, uh, she was the wife of one of the co-founders of the uh, German War Graves Commission. Well, she leads initial negotiations in Britain. She does a couple of tours of the country to look at all these graves. Um, and she's pushing for their centralisation. And this eventually leads to 1959 um, Anglo-German War Graves Agreement. For our purposes, the most significant thing is paragraph three which paragraph three states that the German war graves can be grouped together in order to facilitate their permanent care and maintenance, um, provided that the agreement with the Imperial War Graves Commission is first obtained. That's the important thing. The Germans, the West Germans here, are now allowed to bring together the German war dead into one site. This site turns out to be uh, Cannet Chase, when the Staffordshire County Council donate land for this purpose. And then 1962, 1963, exhumations across Britain start. There's two teams of German grave diggers set to work. They crisscross the country, knocking off one county after the next. They're using principally British labour to do the digging and they're doing the organisation and identification of the dead. And this takes about 18 months or so to exhume all the bodies they were looking for and to move them in sealed caskets down to Cannock Chase, where they're re-interned. Um, well, in theory then, that was that. The scattered dead are now brought together in Cannock Chase and all's well, we can move on. But, um, again, there's more complexities to this than perhaps first meets the eye. And I think really what happens is that in moving the dead from across Britain to a single place, a lot of the complexities of the war dead start to be lost. First, we lose a big connection between place and the circumstances of death. So people, local British people, tend to associate the German graves, one, two, three, four, whatever they were, graves in their local cemetery with a particular event. They're buried there because their plane had been shot down nearby or there was a camp, prison war camp uh, in the vicinity or what have you. But once they're exhumed, these relations disappear. So the Wilmslow Cemetery, for example, um, uh, in Hamforth, where there was a, um, sorry, the Wilmslow Cemetery that contained the dead of the uh, Hamforth POW camp. Well, the association there was with these war dead um, who'd been there, who were buried there because of the location of that camp. When they moved on, the cemetery just becomes another um, British parish churchyard. There's nothing there to ever recognise that there, the German dead were ever there or there was ever a camp nearby. It's just a nice landscape once again. Um, and the dead end up in a landscape to which they've got no connection at all. They were they no relationship to Cannon Chase. The other thing that happens is that the war dead, when they're moved and they're subsumed now under this banner of being German, the, because they're now in the German war cemetery and the press just keep talking about the German cemetery, or even the Germans talk about the Deutsche Soldaten Friedhof, where the uh, German war dead are now congregated. So everybody's really becoming Germans here. It's a kind of blanket definition. But this also wipes out big chunks of the recent past. Because if we go back to Breslau of 1938, well, our man here, Ernst Busch, uh, and by now General Field Marshal, he's captured in France 1945, trying to defend France, brought to Britain, dies in order shot, buried in order shot. Um, 
but he's exhumed early 60s, moved to Cannock Chase. This man who'd led the 16th Army Group in Operation Barbarossa, and involved in various crimes there as two, now lies alongside a completely disconnected and assaulted random connection of dead who have simply been called German war dead. So people like uh, Matthias Wolbe here, who dies in Ochelo camp on the Isle of Man in November 1915. He's brought to Canet Chase. But what's his connection? Well, he's a, been a civilian internee, dies aged 39. He'd been a hairdresser in Paddington, and he died in the Isle of Man just from a heart attack. Or there are a number of Austrians who get tied up in all this. Frank Moss, Austrian citizen, lived in Newcastle for almost 30 years. He dies in 1917 on the Isle of Man uh, when he commits suicide. Or Fenzel Kubenar dies 1919 in Felton Borstal Prison. Now, this is somebody who was um, regarded as being Polish because the British placed in Felton people who they deemed to be rather friendly. So Danes, Alsatians, Poles were sent there because they're seen as enemy or sorry, friendly enemy, potentially friendly enemy. Though their allegiances perhaps are to Poland or Denmark or to France and not to Germany. But when they're dug up in the early 60s, this group suddenly become all German again and they moved to Canet Chase. Other people moved to Canet Chase, um, very different to Bush, are people, well-known example of Wolfgang of Ostberg here, who... Um, was murdered by fellow German prisoners in 1945 because he was accused of being a traitor to the Nazi cause. And they beat him up and killed him. Or Heinrich Heidfeld um, dies in 1942. He was somebody who had fled Nazi Germany in 1933, had been a prominent makeup artist in German films in the interwar period. Dies aged 50 on the Isle of Man, but he's dug up and brought to Canet Chase as a German. Now, this random assortment of individual lives who are brought to Canet Chase as Germans, um, well, they end up there, but there's many other people who don't end up at Canet Chase, perhaps because they're seen as not Germans. Firstly, you've got the exhumation process itself was a bit hit and miss with bits and bodies not being recovered, graves opened and then bodies lost. There's a whole narrative of this that that exists actually. So it's kind of partial removal of people in some cases. But then people who die outside the normal structures of the military or the prison of war system are also lost. So internees, civilian internees who end up in um, asylums, where well, their bodies seem to just disappear and are never brought to Canet Chase. Same for pr female prisoners interned in uh, Pentaville Prison again never make it to Cannon Chase. But perhaps more concerning is the fact that slave labourers from the Channel Islands also miss out. Um, so the German War Grave Commission separates off slave, slave labourers on the Channel Islands um, and decides to send these to Normandy, to northern France, and not rebury them either in Cannon Chase or to rebury them on or in the Channel Islands itself. And as the Home Office points out, many of these dead, um, it says they believe 350 of these people were Russians, but they were French, Belgian, Dutch, Spanish, Polish, Chinese, some Muslim names too. Well, they get separated off and are not counted or viewed somehow as part of this wider German collective. Um, but once again, then, layers of complexity disappear. And the German military dead, um, I suppose, end up emphasising or, or silencing some sort of more awkward past in Canon Chase. So how are we to read this history of exhumation? Well, I think we can safely say that Canon Chase is an incomplete cemetery. It may be called German, but it's a very selective interpretation of that. I wouldn't say that there was a willful attempt to sanitise the past as such. Because in many respects, it, it sort of is the culmination of this long-standing plan, this long-standing plan to centralise the dead at Canic Chase. 
nonetheless, moving all these different groups and these different individuals to Canic Chase does help to normalise the Second World War German dead. It embeds them in a narrative with heroic national sacrifice, very much like the British dead, who um, lay in similar national cemeteries. The inclusions of civilians, First World War dead, helped to do this, as did the separation out of the First World War, separately dead, um, who were given their own graves at Cannock Chase, specially decorated uh, for the 1967 uh, dedication. And this sense of kind of noble heroism tones down the other dead at Cannock, I would say. And you can see this with the kind of conflation of all the dead when the Volksbund, the German War Graves Commission's president, gives his dedication speech in 67. He said, we pay homage here to the German soldiers who died after hard and bitter suffering during two world wars and who found their rest in Britain's soil. Now, constructing this central site also had other advantages for honing this narrative. It was the perfect setting for grand gestures. Um, so it becomes a place for international diplomacy. It also comes a place for youth work as reconciliation. There's big exchanges as well between the youth of um, Stafford and Bremen, the, the uh, reciprocal visits across, all as part of the idea of reconciliation. And that's great. But there's also other issues that go on as you move everybody to one cemetery and to try and bring things together here. Um, when these new Germans or these Germans are created and everybody becomes German at Canic Chase, you also end up creating new enemies. So during the 1967 dedication, red paint was sprawled across some of the new headstones, the Second World War, First World War headstones, with things on them like lads go home or uh, Belson or, or what have you. There's a lot of graffiti all over it. Now the Vandal wasn't inter interested then in these intricacies of the past. It was interested, or he, I say he, they weren't interested in the intricacies between the British, uh, sorry, between the German dead of the First World War, Second World War, whatever. They just treated the whole lot as a group of Germans. So rather than normalising the German dead, what actually happens with the creation of Canet Chase is the complete opposite. All the dead, regardless of their past individual circumstances, individual lives, now become symbols of one recent dark past. I think there's a lot more I could say about Canet Chase, but I think I should leave things there. And thank you for listening. Well, thank you for staying with us and having listened to Tim's presentation. Let's have a bit of a discussion of some of the key themes and obviously I'm going to be biased in my archaeological emphasis but hopefully this will be interesting have a sort of discussion between a historian and archaeologist about sort of 20th century exhumation and exhumation and commemoration of the dead so I mean one of the things that really interested me about your talk was this um you know this this, this issue of how memory is being selective or at least there's active forgetting to create this ethno-nationalist sacrificial memory and I is it is it right to call that a selection or a sanitization of um to create that identity? I mean, how much I suppose what I'm asking is how much intent was behind the the choices you've identified in who gets exhumed and who gets buried at Cannock Chase, or how much of is is it sort of a casual happenstance of policy? Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah, I think that's the that's the really the big underpinning question about Cannock Chase is about who gets moved there and who doesn't get moved there. So in total, it's getting on for about 5,000 people move there. But why these people and why not others? Because not everyone, and that's the point I'm making the presentation, is actually moved to Cannock Chase. Um, I suppose the aim of Cannock Chase to go back was to create a German national cemetery. OK, so and there's nothing I suppose there's nothing really unique in that, is there? Because we've got British war cemeteries formed by the Imperial War Graves Commission, later Commonwealth War Graves Commission. So I think the underpinning idea is the same. British ones, or the British dead, and Empire dead. And the German one is the equivalent of this. So it's not a uniquely German issue here. Um, but what underpins this, whether it's British or German, I suppose, are these decisions then. It's the decisions about who you are taking. And we've already seen, and you'll have seen as well, with the 
recent discussion with the Commonwealth War Graves Commission in terms of um, the race report that came out and the fact that not everybody was treated exactly the same in terms oh, yeah. of British cemeteries and that built on the work of um, Michelle Barrett, wasn't it? Well, I suppose we've got that in Britain, but we've also got then got similar issues with this um, German War Graves Cemetery, but bigger issues because the problem here is you're dealing with the dead of the First World War and the dead of the Second World War. Um, and that's, I suppose that's fairly unique in this circumstances because other German war cemeteries after, say, after World War II, they're just moving the Second World War dead. Yes. In Britain, you've just got, the, you've got both and that's very different. Um, so you've got that issue. And, and then on top of that, I suppose, we've got the fact that who is German? And that's changed massively from nine from the 60s through to the time of the first world war because in the first world war we've got you know we've got people who could be determined to be polish or danish or or even french from alsace and lorraine mm. and some of those members who were then german died in britain now are they german or are they not german and decisions had to be made there um and then on, on top of that i suppose you've got with the world war ii dead some of these dead um, well, we've got civilians, we've got refugees from Germany, people flee in Germany, and now they've been determined perhaps as German or not as German. Um, and there's also the case of, a few cases, I think, of, of Russian members of the German Wehrmacht. Mm. Now, were they willingly fighting in the, for the German army or not? And, uh, you know, how are we determine them? Are we determining who wore German uniform, who was German? or what it's a bit unclear now it, it i haven't uh, to be honest i haven't totally unpicked whether this was haphazard or whether there was a, a a determined kind of um underpinning to this to forget something i think it, it perhaps was a bit, a bit a bit of both going on at different times but decisions were made and i think it's important to try and unpick those somehow that's really interesting. I mean, just to follow up on that, I mean, I suppose, and this is just a crude, it's not comparable, I appreciate, but if you look at the Commonwealth dead, you know, the regimental, the nationality of Australia, New Zealand, um, even if they're finding themselves in sort of other regiments, I, there's complex processes here. I know, I know there are obviously, you know, regiments and battalions fighting and, you know, they, they are, you know, they're, they're under the colours, so to speak, of the different Commonwealth nations. And then there's others that are, you know, being, you know, in corp because of circumstances of fighting, in, you know, in, in other sort of British regiments. But either way, many of those, their, 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 their name themselves, their, their ethnicity, their identity is somehow reflected in that, within that uniformity of the Commonwealth um, cemetery. But there doesn't seem, there's no similar sort of layering of identity within the German Canix Chase, if I recall rightly. It's it's very it is you you know of of there's regimental names and and, and ranks, but there's no there's no sense of multi ethnic you know identities in any sense. If, no, of course you've got as you as you point out with the the British headstones you have on this different symbols that are utilized yeah. that give some idea of the background of and the identity of people there. As well as the uh, the allowance of uh, I think it's about sixty characters or so that individual families could put on the bottom of a headstone as well to give identity. Sure. Now there isn't any of that, as you know, from the German Canic Chase Cemetery. It's it's very much kind of pared back, simply uh, small details uh, focused on the name principally. So we so we lack that um, ability to try and go further deeper down to unpick mm. who's there. Um, but I guess with the Commonwealth War Grave Cemeteries, one of the problems has been, or one of the points has been made, in the, particularly in the race report, is that further outside of Europe, the further you get away from Europe, that element's also missing from, from these war cemeteries, right. that you're lucky if you've got a name at best, but you wouldn't have any details of people's lives beyond that. So yeah. that's a fair point I think you make, though. And, and it leads me to the next thing that really interests me as an archaeologist, because there's a, just a new paper out in the journal Antiquity about early medieval exhumation and re reinvestigating existing graves. 
Um, and so this is a theme that cross cuts periods. And there's been discussions in later prehistory, too, and the Roman period and, and the later medieval period and moving up to the present day. Um, and so this issue of exhumation uh, as a process and you describe it in your paper and talk about the German organisation, British labour, by which these bodies were collected up. But then you also mention the issues of or at least anecdotes of you know, partial removal of, of variant pa practices and how this was done. I mean, how much do we actually know from photographs or from written sources about that exhumation process? Mm -hmm. No, that's a fair point. And this is a massive, obviously a massive issue here. So the German uh, cemetery Kamenek Chase, uh, dedicated, consecrated in uh, 1967, the dead have to get there somehow, of course, because up until this point, they're not on Canic Chase. So we've got to move all of those bodies to Canic Chase, and that's moving bodies from the First World War and the Second World War. Now, if you're moving bodies from the First World War, some of these people have been lying around for 50 or almost 50 years, I guess, uh, potentially, before yes. they moved to Canic Chase. So it's a massive operation. Um, it takes place from... I think it's about spring 62 through the early summer 63, where the dead are, are unearthed and uncovered and brought to Canet Chase. Um, and this is in itself a rather multi-layered process because before you can dig people up, you've got to get permissions from local health authorities. Um, you need to, whether in, the dead are in consecrated ground, you've got to also yes. ensure that you've got faculties from the Church of England to dig yeah. people up and move them. So there's a lot of administration before this. It doesn't just suddenly happen. Mm. Uh, um, and there's also considerable planning. Then it's led by the German War Graves Commission, um, and they're working and liaising as well with the Com or Commonwealth War Graves Commission to do this. So they're working in partnership almost, although it's a German operation. Um, a lot of pre-planning behind this. Everything to like getting permission to bring in their own lorries and trucks and spades and shovels because of course Britain's not part of Europe at that time so it requires um, customs duties and forms to be filled in for all the equipment and the people coming over as well so there's a lot of admin behind it um, they then work through they work through 62 into 63 they're covering the whole country in two teams moving around they've employed British labour principally to do the digging and to dig yes. up the dead um, and then once the dead are exhumed, there is, a, I think there's a, there was a genuine attempt to try and identify them with um, proper forensic um, uh, identification going on with dental records, bone measurements and so forth to try and check who they've got. Oh, right. OK. So it, it did seem to be done fairly thoroughly. But having said that, it wasn't and it can't have been a simple task because a lot of the First World War dead have been buried six to a grave. And six to a grave after 50 years when you're uncovering them, um, it's unclear exactly how you were separating out who was who. Because I've looked at the pre-papers on some of this where the discussions beforehand about who they're exhuming. And often it said, well, there's too many in this grave. We wouldn't be able to separate them. It'd be impossible. So these won't be exhumed. Okay. And you look at the post reports and they're like, oh, they're at Canic Chase after all. So um, somehow something was exhumed. It's unclear what. Well, that's really interesting, obviously, because forensic archaeology in the 1960s didn't actually exist, you know, and, uh, you know, um, forensic, you know, this, this, you know, we've seen massive changes in how the police have been in uh, and forensic investigations have been improved by modern archaeological methods. And so, you know, one wonders how much this was down to local grave diggers being employed or, or, or just local labourers being employed, um, doing what they usually do and making a bit of a guess. Well, interestingly, they didn't use local grave diggers. They, okay. they basically the German teams came over to the United Kingdom and they went to labour exchanges, if you like, and put out adverts and we want people who are willing to do hard labour, digging up um, bodies. And then they took the team of British workers and they they went around on the lorry with the German team and they did the digging. They went from one cemetery to the next and they had no, no connection at all to that cemetery. Um, and they'd never been there before. And right. 
And I, I interviewed one of these British diggers a few years ago. I conducted an oral history with him, um, asked him how he'd come to this job. And he said, well, you know, needed some money. This one paid quite well. So I went down and took it. And he said it was great. I, I did the digging during the week. Then I sped back down to, to London. And I spend the weekend in London, spend the money and go back and do some more digging during the week again. Um, but he did say it was sometimes quite a horrific process because particularly when you had six people to a grave, he said you had to be digging a massively deep trench several oh. metres down. And there was always the fear that the whole thing was going to collapse in on you. Oh. Um often waterlogged and, and, and so on and so forth. So he said it was a very dangerous enterprise, actually. And that was probably the worst thing of it. He said, once you've seen a body, you've seen a body. That didn't matter. It was more the fear that the whole, almost like mining, it was all going to collapse in on you. I mean, that's true. Of, that's a really interesting point. For those who don't perhaps are aware of it listening, um, people have a perhaps a, a, a TV understanding of grave digging it, that six foot under doesn't look never is six foot in the TV. You know, it, it you really are going very, very deep and very narrow. And if they aren't, I mean, the modern archaeological excavations don't do that anymore because people do get buried alive. <laughs> um, uh, and so you have to sort of splay out the trenches, pull back the edges mm. to to terrace it down. Um, because it can be absolutely treacherous, especially in different soil conditions. So it's really interesting to hear that he thought that the actual trench sides were his worst enemy in this horrific process. That's that is fascinating. Um, and and you know, so do, it was was it in the press at all, or was this all done in, not in a cloud of secrecy, but was it just kept reasonably out of the public eye? It was kept out of the public eye. So there was a determination between both war graves commission that nothing about this will get into the press and it will not be recorded or reported. Yeah, yeah. There were journalists, though, that obviously they've, as soon as people started digging up in the cemetery, news came and journalists came down to see what's going on. Um, and it generally what's said is that nobody wanted to speak to them, though, from any of the, dig it, the teams digging up and it, it was just hush hush. So it was all supposed to be done as quietly as possible, as little fuss as possible. The, and indeed, um, locals often only discovered what had happened when um, they go back to the cemetery and see that there's now an absence and a void and something's missing. Um, and often actually quite upset that the Germans have been moved or these bodies have been shifted as, as well. So, yes, it was all it was all completely hush hush, actually. The, the biggest complaints, I think, really came from local clergy who didn't want somebody exhumed no they're saying well 50 they've been lying there 50 years is there really anything left of them to dig up is this a is this even christian to do this so it wasn't always a warmly welcome process so at least from that that local parochial identity these were part of the community yeah they uh, were they were They've been there decades sometimes. Mm. Um, the graves, if you say you've got one grave in a parish churchyard, you've been, it's been there, it's been tended, people are aware of it, people have, people have laid flowers on it, and then suddenly it's gone. It was a part of that churchyard, so it this creates is, a new absence. This is true of many parts of these this island or these islands, is that you know, the parish is proud of the graves. They even identi unidentified mariners who are washed up on the shore at the coastal parishes. You know, they, they want to respect and have that Christian burial within the churchyard. So whether it's war dead or you know other unnamed or dislocated individuals, there, there's that sense of community within the cemetery. That's really interesting within the churchyard. So, I mean, if we're going to that's really interesting. So if we, my third question really is about, you know, what do we do about this? Then you've identified this you know this 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 forgetting you know is is there a responsibility or is there a role for us as as researchers to you know recreate those or create diverse narratives to use a phrase for the the german dead that the sort of the the complement or even subvert or complicate that nationalist narrative you know enter some of that identity complexity of the individual stories and you know i mean that's part of what i got out of what you were trying to do but how do you how do we how do we take that forward 
I mean, yeah, that's a difficult question. It's an important question as well, because obviously, as and the point I was making really is that we we have that diversity of death um, in these original locations that people would know that say, I don't know, there's fifty, there were fifty Germans, for example, say in um, Manchester Southern Cemetery or, or what have you. I think actually, I think it was a few more than that, but they were buried there because it was down the road from um, the Nell Lane military hospital from the first world war so you've got that connection between why people are there and why they've died or people know that say a second world war bomber had come down nearby and that's why you've got five german uh, buried in your local parish church so you've got that diversity and you've got that thus also a diversity of narratives about the two world wars too that they're not it's not just a british narrative for the wars it's a war it's a narrative that involves enemy and friends i guess yes. because you've got multiple dead scattered across the country now the canic chase created canic chase cemetery has brought these so-called germans together but it's left these voids elsewhere so we've we've now entered more of a in order to remember more i suppose we've ended up forgetting more at the same time and it's it's, it's what you do about that now you, i don't think we can go in and suddenly um reconfigure Canic Chase Cemetery or add greater details to these people's lives on their headstones or something. Okay. So what I think could be done, and actually what I, I'm quite keen to, to move towards trying to do, is more of a kind of digital mapping exercise where we go and we, we recreate these voids, or we would fill these voids perhaps digitally, because if we could do a mapping exercise and say, well, okay, in Chester, Chester's Overly Cemetery, for example, there were two German dead there. Oh. Then the question comes again, well, why were they in Overly Cemetery? Yes. Yeah. And, and where are they now? What happened to them? And so I think it would be great to try and reconnect local communities to these missing enemy dead, but it would have to be done in a digital format now to fill the voids. That does sound somewhat like um the digital potentials that are being fulfilled for holocaust memorialization of you know trying to presence in where there are no surviving communities there are perhaps no or very few jewish survivors in a whole city you know because of the holocaust um or at least if there are people of jewish descent there they're not the direct descendants of the people that were literally you know decimated from that city say a dutch city or german city in the second world war or before um, and, and you know, digitally, we are now trying. Projects are trying to sort of represence those, 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 those lost communities. I mean, so in some ways, the, is that is that a parallel there, or is that not? Is that too crude? Well, um, we're dealing with obviously very different histories here. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so we won't don't want to go too far down that path, of course, because um, some of our dead it cannot trace our our perpetrators in the Holocaust, as oh. well as being buried, that oh. kind of chance. Um, but you're right, when it comes to Jewish history and the history of the Holocaust, attempts have been made to try and fill these voids. We've got the physical attempt, um, the stumbling stones, the Stolpersteine that oh. sit in the pavements yeah. in German cities that show you where residents, Jewish res residents had once lived. And often with um, a, a comment about um, where they died as well so that's tried to fill this fill this aspect of forgetting and bring people back into a kind of urban landscape now the dead in cemeteries in this country um i suppose we're not in a position and we want to try and recreate that physically mm. that would be done but a digital alternative which there are also examples of in Holocaust studies, mm. perhaps is what I'm thinking about here too. Yes, so yeah, yes. those are good examples. That's really interesting because I, I do feel that, we got, no, not this, notwithstanding that to take away the Holocaust sensitive parallel, but this, the, digi the potential of digital media to make local communities aware of the stories that come from beyond their immediate bounds is surely a powerful connection and surely is, is there a kind of responsibility in the 21st century to combat sort of the perhaps more jingoistic remembrance of, uh, of the world wars where every community most communities have a war memorial and it is it is very easy to 
for people to be sucked into. It was about our loss only. You know, is there a way in which this project, this kind of initiative could challenge that sort of British or English or Welsh nationalism, you know, and, and that is so much present in the nature of war memorialisation from the early 20s, you know? Yes, I'd like to think so, because I think the thing we've lacked and the thing, one of the things we're missing locally in this country is the di- kind of diversity of war dead. Now, um, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission has recently launched as part of its Memorial Week events. It has launched a, a kind of app where you can see who died from your street and where they're buried right. during the, the World Wars. But this is again British dead. So yes. it, it is recreating a very British narrative of war dead and British war graves. Um, and as you say, war memorials are, are, are also a part of that. So if you go down to the war memorial in Chester Town Hall, in Chester itself, we've got dead from the First World War fighting on the British side or the Allied side from Belgium. Their names are not there, although they're buried in Chester. Um, we've got the, the German dead in buried in, who were buried in Chester. Their names are not there. Um, you've got more diverse group of dead um, in Blaken Cemetery with Polish and Russians and um, Dutch and so on and so forth and still some Germans actually. Their names are not on local memorials because they were not members of uh, the Chester community. So we we have this very kind of silo effect of who where do you belong and where that's where your names are but that that ignores and that we lose that full diversity and I think that's important. Another striking example for me is actually Hanful. Hanful that we know from the the big storm recently about Hanful Parish Council and so forth. Oh yes, of course I didn't make the connection, yes. <laughs> yes, Hanful. <laughs> but um, Han, Hanful was the site of a very large First World War prisoner of war camp um, the handful for those who don't know in the east of Cheshire near, near uh, Wilmslow Stockport way well it had one of the largest POW camps in this country in the first world war and I think 20 over 20 Germans died in that camp during the first world war and were buried in Wilmslow cemetery their bodies were exhumed and moved to Cannock Chase in the 60s so there's no trace of them anymore there Now, during the centenary of the First World War, citizens in Hamforth decided to put up a new First World War memorial for the dead of Hamforth because they decided that there wasn't enough kind of uh, sites of memory for uh, the dead in their their town. So they've they've erected this new war memorial and it has about the names of, uh, from the First World War, I think 10, 12 First World War dead, all British dead. None of those died in Hanful. Yet we had 20 odd people who were German who did die in Hanful in the First World War. There's no mention of them because they're German. So I think trying to place these people back into the community who in, in some ways had a greater connection to Hanful than others is very important. And that's one of the things I think um, I'd like to pursue as this project builds forward, really. That's fascinating, and there's there's so much potential for linking to local communities, and and I know I haven't said, but this all builds on important work that uh, Tim's already been doing with um, on on diverse narratives and 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 uh, the war dead, and and there's a fantastic video I will put a link in the description <laughs> below, um, are, are talking about Chester in particular as a case study, uh, but I want to take our discussion a little bit to Cannock Chase again because for those who haven't been or perhaps have only superficially uh, visited I mean can you can you talk a little bit further about the choices made about the location and arrangement of that that German cemetery in the 1960s? Yeah no that's this is also a very important question thank you Howard. Um, I suppose the this is a point I made in present in that presentation really the way to look at it is that it's not a new idea. So it's built in the early 60s, yeah. but it's developing on from a long standing desire amongst the German War Graves Commission for one central cemetery for the German war dead in Britain. 
And as I think I said in the presentation, they're really they're really trying to do that through, well, most prominently through the early 30s uh, when discussions took off about where they could place a German war cemetery in Britain. And at that time, before the Second World War, they were thinking about four sites for a potential war cemetery. Um, at that time, Cannock wasn't one of those sites, though. Um, OK, but we've got that that desire there already before World War Two. It's then accelerated after the Second World War because you've got even more dead and thus um, a kind of feeling that now's the time we definitely do have to have a central war cemetery. Um, so what leads them to Cannock Chase? Well, I think one important factor is there's already a Commonwealth War Graves Commission cemetery at Cannock Chase, on Cannock Chase. And for those of you who've seen the German one, it's on the same road. It's just at the start of the road and the German one's at the bottom of the road, right? So we've already got a precedent there. And what's more about the um, German, uh, sorry, the existing Cannock Chase Cemetery, the, the, the British one, is that it contains already quite a lot of German war dead in it. Um, 221, I'm just looking at the figure here, there were 221 German First World War soldiers in the Cannock War Cemetery, the British one already. Because nearby POW camps. Uh, yes, there was the Brockton uh, POW camp that was nearby. Okay. So these are people who died there during the First World War and were buried there. So this meant, I think, that, well, OK, if we've already got a war cemetery there and we've already got German war dead there, then could that be expanded somehow? It also meant that the German War Graves Commission, who had done various tours of Britain, were aware of that cemetery and had seen it and knew it was there. And they liked the setting, they liked the location. Right. It's, you know, it's right out on Cannock Chase. It, it's it's um, a nice natural setting, which is what they're after. So it, it sort of ticked lots of, lots of boxes. Okay. That's how it comes about, really. Um, and then I think really in the 50s, they've settled on that as the site they want. And the, the, the Imperial War Coast Commission, as it still was, agreed to that too and thought, yes, if we could do that. The land comes from Staffordshire County Council, who by chance um, had acquired the land, I think, from uh, Earl of Litchfield, who given the part of his land, his estates, to Staffordshire County Council. Right. And that meant Staffordshire County Council had the land that they could then give to the German War Graves Commission. And that's how it came about. That's really interesting because um, I don't think, at least for me, I know that Cannock Chase has military training heritage and vaguely I'm aware of that dimension, but I never really it's it's only very recently. I just this is an aside. This has nothing to do with the interview. It's only really recently come to my mind how Cannock, whether I assume by accident, has such a significant threshold position in uh, uh, um, political geography of the, the British Isles. And I, I don't know if I haven't really read much about that, but I want to learn more about that. But I, I'm sure that's incidental because it, it is geographically central but, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, there's practical and things that. But I, I'm just interested in that whole di dynamic of Canic. But that's interesting. Well, I actually, I think we probably that's an, uh, it could be another factor really is the, you know, the centrality of that within geographically within the UK. Because one of the arguments that the War Graves Commission, the German one had made was, if all the dead were in one place, it would make it easier for people to visit. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you'd want to make your 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 cemetery fairly central, therefore, within the country mm. and, and accessible. Have you any thoughts on the arc? I mean, whether personal or you know, other um, more more academic thoughts on the on the actual architecture and sculpture of the cemetery? Because you mentioned the the landscape and the trees trying to evoke a sense of the German landscape in a general sense. But what about the architecture and sculpture? I know that's not your 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 forte and it's not mine either, but I, I just wondered whether you, ha you had any thoughts about the Canic Cemetery in those regards. Yeah, uh, that's true. It isn't really, it really isn't my strength. <laughs> Fair enough. But, uh, I'd have to get you some of your thoughts on it as well, actually. But um, I, I suppose one thing initially that, that is worth mentioning, of course, is it's not an overly grandiose cemetery no. now 
one of the criticisms of the German War Graves Commission is that there's a kind of continuity of architectural design from the Nazi period through into the 50s because some of the well in fact a lot of the same personnel are still in place they're using the same architects that were, were doing a lot of the work yeah. in the 30s and 40s and they're still using them in the 1950s the chief architect uh, Tischler is still employed until he dies I think late 50s okay. so and thus that led to some fairly ooh, I think people are now looking at the uncomfortable kind of war cemetery, German war cemetery design, such as the one for El Alamein in North Africa. Well, I don't think any of that comes through in the same way in Canet Chase. Right. I think Canet Chase is more in keeping with its surroundings. And I think it, if you like, it kind of replicates and plays on uh, some of the... Um, architectural symbolism from up the road from the the, the Imperial War Graves Cemetery. Mm. Um, so both of them situated within Canet Chase. They don't, there are subtle differences to them, but it's not like one stands out as being out of place in comparison to the other, I would say. Mm. Um, so we've got, I suppose we've got big Christian crosses, you know, the, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission's kind of great cross. This one's also placed into a Christian tradition with a large cross at its centre. Um, it's handy, therefore, that they never exhumed the Jewish soldiers of the First World War for, who fought for Germany and buried in this country, oh. or Jewish refugees who fled Germany as well, who technically could have come under this remit and moved oh. them to Canada Chains. Um, so I think it, 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 there's a lot of crossover between the two. Um, what else have we got with it? I'm trying to think. I think there's there's odd bits like the Zeppelin graves, you know, the fact that these are placed very prominently and separate to the other parts. Yeah, yeah. There's four big Zeppelin graves. Um, all the dead in one place there, so I one thought... casket for all of them. Yeah. Uh, and that's placing them somehow up on a plinth, separate as being somehow more prominent than the other dead. That's puzzling. And that they're a cul-de-sac, aren't they? You visit through that central with the sculpture and then you either go right to the Zeppelin graves, which are at end point, or then you go left and out into the cemetery. So they are uh, given a discrete sort of apse in use ecclesiastical architectural terms. You know, they're, they're given a separate sort of chapel of uh, you know, open air, but, you know, the separate space, um, which is fascinating. I, I, yeah, I can't yeah. think of any comparable thing I've seen like that. Yes, and it, it is interesting, but I mean, because these dead, those those who died in the airships were held in rather a prominent position within Germany in the interwar years. Um, and the fact that that then continues over into the, oh. into the into the 50s as it's been designed and, and then realised in the 60s is, is important, perhaps. You mentioned there that there is that there's that sculptural piece as you go in, isn't there? Yes. Of a, um, a soldier, I think, lying down. With a, a, a cloth covering his body, and that was designed by a German architect Hans Wimmer from Munich, um, who'd, who'd worked with the War Graves Commission again quite frequently. So he'd done other sculptures for them already, and this was his effort for Canic Chase. And, uh, again, I suppose we can say, you know, it's showing it's a figurative piece, um, but. It, it, it's not trying to recreate some kind of masculine no. uh, uh, martial figure here. It, it, no. It's somebody lying down who's died. So the, the the emphasis on death is there rather than some kind of um, something glorifying war, I guess, mm. a bit more. So there are, it, it perhaps marks a change from some of the earlier German war cemeteries. Fascinating. I mean, I think there's, I haven't seen anything quite like it. So I, don't, I haven't seen any of the other German cemeteries um, in person um, um, uh, or discussions of them. So I was just interested in that. I mean, um, one thing that did strike me when I visited was the pairing of names on headstones, because while we said there is a stark distinction between the rest of the cemetery and the Zeppelin, you know, graves, which are collective, each gravestone does have a pairing, doesn't it, if I remember rightly? I mean, is that something that's common elsewhere or is that something distinctive to Canuck? No, you're right. They, the, the 
the war dead are um, with two names on headstone. And that's not distinctive to Canet because German war cemeteries elsewhere, um, I'm thinking here, some of the ones on the Western Front have two names on a headstone. Oh, right. OK. So it has been used elsewhere, that technique. I have, I mean, and I have gone through, I did work in the um, German War Graves Commission archive a few times and gone through all the papers they have on Canet Trace and construction of it. It never seems to get mentioned that. Um, it just said... It's just said as if it's a given, there'd be two names on headstone. It doesn't explain why that needs to be done. Um, I think it had been done earlier for financial reasons and space reasons, you know. So if you've got a small plot of land, you can fit people more closely together. Um, and then finance is always a really important point to the establishment of these war cemeteries. How much is a headstone going to cost? Who's going to fund it? Who's going to pay for it? And the German War Graves Commission is funded principally by donations, by public donations. It, it is different. It has a much smaller bu budget than the, the British equivalent. So finance was always really important to them and keeping costs down. And this is a way to help do that. You're naming people, you're giving individual graves as such, but you're keeping those costs manageable. So I, I wonder if that's a factor here. So, but there, I mean, I am right in thinking that that would look incredibly strange to find that in a Commonwealth war grave context. I don't know if it's unknown, but certainly I've never come across that in a Commonwealth context. Is that right? No, there are shared, there are oh. headstones with several dead on them when it's been impossible to disentangle bodies. OK, yeah. yes, actually, I, I think I've seen a couple, actually. Yes, actually thinking about it. Mm. Interesting. Fascinating. So, I mean, final question really is to think about, is to ask you about what you were talking about. The You've mentioned some graffiti and I mean, what I want to get us a general sense of is, is it, who cares? Does anyone visit these cemeteries? I mean, are, how have they been used? Since, I mean, I didn't mean that. Who cares? Of course they care. But I mean, how, how, who are the, who are the active users of these spaces? I mean, military boffins and enthusiasts and amateurs from all nations will want to visit can it chase and pay respects it's not just a german thing but of course it's a pilgrimage site for for families but i mean can you give us a sense of the the, the range of uh, mm. visitors that well, as far as we know yeah no that's true i mean you you go to all this effort to create this space and then what's its purpose and and that's that would apply to any war cemetery really um it's a big i suppose it ultimately comes down to a big kind of tidying up exercise and that's what's gone on now here though it's more complicated because the dead were already in they already had graves they already they were already cared for under the remit initially of the commonwealth or the imperial then the commonwealth war graves commission that was responsible for caring for these graves right. under the treaty of versailles so it wasn't that they were neglected they were cared for so and people and relatives used to visit these graves wherever they were. So Germans would come over and visit the graves in whatever parish churchyard to see their loved ones. So if you move them to Canet Chase, what's changed there? People, the relatives are still able to come over as they would have done before, just to somewhere completely different. So there's a question mark over what's the point of doing that. Um, now, German War Graves Commission still to this day runs regular tours and trips to its sites around the world and through the 70s 80s probably even into the 90s they would have a trip every few years where you could take a coach tour from germany and come over to canic chase but while you're there you do the sites of stratford and um gosh wherever else <laughs> is worth visiting in the uk <laughs> A gesture if you're lucky and um you'd go and you'd go and be on a coach tour but part of that would take you to the the war graves and some of the people on these coach trips were relatives of the dead yeah. but mainly well, i think almost exclusively second world war dead by this yeah. day um so you've got them those people visiting producing and creating a central german war cemetery you're creating a place for international engagement so where dignitaries can come together Mm. They can lay reefs as a sign of reconciliation and so forth. Although I think Canet's not necessarily ideal for that because it's outside of London. So if somebody, a German minister is making a flying visit to the UK, 
he or she isn't necessarily always going to get up to Canic Chase. So it, it has served that function, but perhaps less often. Um, you got they're still going on to the present are exchanges between young people from Stafford and Bremen in North Germany. And they they come over each year and some German youth uh, come to sorry, come to Stafford and some British youth go to Bremen. And there's this long standing partnership there. Um, and the Germans come over, the, the young people <coughs> look around the country, look around that part of the country and um, but also clean the headstones and so on and so forth. So they, they do that kind of work. They were initially involved with um, setting out the, the cemetery in the early 60s when they first came over. Oh, um, right. Digging. I don't think they were digging graves, but I think they were they dug the central perimeter trench that runs around the cemetery was dug by German youths. That's pretty hefty ditch, actually. Yes, yeah. they dug that. <laughs> and, that's not uh, a small little, uh, yeah, if I remember right there, yeah, it's quite big, yeah. And that's important. So that is certainly important. And some of the discussions from the German War Graves Commission, not just about Cannot Chase, but about war cemeteries more generally, is how do we engage young people in this? How are we going to ensure that this carries on when the relatives have died and passed on? Who's going to be interested in these places? Who's going to be working with them? So getting young people involved at this stage is an important thing to do because it ensures the legacy carries on through. Commonwealth War Graves Commission today, uh, you know, faces the same issue. How do you get young people interested in these war cemeteries and how do you ensure that thus this organisation continues in the way that it does? And one way around this is to ensure youth activities. So both War Graves Commission face this problem and they, they try and get youth and young people involved in that way. Um, as you said at the start, though, other people who've come over to or had some involvement in Canada Chase War Cemetery are neo-Nazis. So there's people who regularly lay reefs on various uh, graves at Canada Chase for more controversial people buried there, um, some SS and high-ranking oh, Germans. And then there have been, over time, various vandalism incidents at Canada Chase, particularly, as I mentioned in the presentation, with the day of its dedication the night before graffiti over lots of it that had to be scrubbed out quite rapidly before it was formally opened. Right. right. So there we go. <laughs> so it's, it's a real it's a, and, and but there's been no upsurge in, in any of that nonsense, has there? Or has it been an ongoing problem since the 60s? Or do we not know for sure? Is from what I can tell, from no, it's it's, it's gone through various waves of, of okay. moments. There's there's no upsurge, and, and perhaps it was worse in the sixties because it was a new imposition yeah. on the chase. Now it's more of a kind of settled part of the landscape there. Well, thank you so much for answering all my questions, and I think this has been a really um, I mean, it's a fascinating piece of research. It, it dovetails with so much of your other exciting research, which, of course, is also part of what you teach here at the University of Chester. But um, but, you know, and we'll put all the links that you would like people to follow up. If anyone wants to follow up on Tim's research or um, any of the broader history uh, programs that we teach, of course, or maybe postgraduate supervision. You know, we'll put links into the the the. The bottom of the video so you can follow those up but i just want to give tim an opportunity to any final thoughts on on where his research is going or on this piece of research uh, before we we sign off well no uh, thanks howard for the for the discussions yeah well can it chase is just one small part of what i'm trying to research at the moment um is trying to uncover more of the german side of this because within germany itself after world war one the British had done something similar there in that they had exhumed their dead mm. and moved to four central cemeteries in Germany after the First World War. And that involved a similar kind of activity right. of exhuming, moving, reburying. And that took place throughout, I think, from about 21 to 25 in Germany. And I need to and really am looking to explore much more of that for the German example. I've been slightly let's say COVID has got in the way of all this because all my archival visits have uh, hit a bit of a brick wall at the moment. So I, that, this is why I'm pursuing this area that's closer at home while I can. So, But there's much more to come, much more to come. 
It's exciting stuff. Well, thank you again, T Tim, for all your time and energies and for letting us share your presentation and for this conversation. And, uh, you know, uh, there'll be more videos like this. Hopefully we can have more videos that link up uh, different disciplinary approaches to the dead and how we commemorate them moving forward on this Archaeodeath channel. But for now, thanks very much, Tim. Thank you, Howard. Pleasure. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to Howard Williams on YouTube. In addition, consider following the Archaeodeath WordPress blog at howardwilliamsblog.wordpress.com.